If you watch the channel at all, you're probably aware that I'm a big Tandy fan, especially the Color Computer line, so it's with great excitement that I'm going to cover the Color Computer 3 today in honor of Sep Tandy on Vintage Geek. The computer I grew up with and the computer that I learned to code with was the Tandy Color Computer 2, and I have a number of fond memories of this system, using it for various functions and learning the basics of coding. Granted, I didn't really fully understand it at the time, but it was such a great tool and such an integral part of my childhood that I can't help but think about it with fondness. Now, the next computer in that line of products from Tandy was the Color Computer 3, and many out there have said that this was by far the best color computer, which makes sense. It was the last one in the line, and it had a lot of advanced features that the other color computers didn't have at the time. So today we're going to cover the Color Computer 3, some of its peripherals, and specifically in the kind of graphics tablet category, because it's something we haven't talked about here on Vintage Geek, and this kind of came to shine with the Tandy product line around this time. So I want to cover that, as well as talking about the system in general. Now, looking at the actual Color Computer 3, you would be hard to spot the differences, at least at first glance, from the Color Computer 2. There's some subtle differences, though. First of all is the obvious one in the badging. We've got the 100 128K Color Computer 3 listed at the top, which is of course one of the biggest differences in the 3 model was that it came by default with 128K of RAM. Now this was also expandable later on to 512K of RAM, and this particular Color Computer 3 does have that original add-on, and it is the original Radio Shack version. It's not an OEM version like I've seen available out there. Now the keyboard itself is very much the same as the Color Computer 2. It has the same type of keys. They have full motion keys and they feel pretty good. I was always a fan of this keyboard for the Color Computer 2. It seemed to work well. Now in this version, the main difference is that we've got all of the arrow keys in the same place on the keyboard. So in the Color Computer 2, these were spread out. The side arrows were on one side and the up and down arrows were on the other, which made games, if you were trying to use the arrow keys, kind of cumbersome. So it's kind of nice to have those all in one place. You also have a couple of F keys, the F1 and F2 for function keys that you can now use in the Color Computer 3 version. But again, everything else is pretty much the same. You've got the gray surround around the keyboard rather than the black surround from some of the earlier models. Not a big difference there. And of course, with this particular model, as with all of them, you do get the side cartridge slot. That's compatible with almost all of the Color Computer 1 and 2 games, with a couple of exceptions. The appliance controller cartridge actually does not work on the 3 because of some graphics mode that only the 1 and the 2 supported. And I think there may be a couple of other examples of that as well, but for the most part it was completely backward compatible. Looking at the back plane of the system, everything again is very similar, but you're going to see one major difference right off the bat. You have separate jacks here for the audio and composite video. This was new for the Color Computer 3. As of the Color Computer 2, the only video output from the factory was the standard RF Channel 3 or 4 output, which you can still get on the Color Computer 3 using the RF out jack, and it has the normal selector between Channel 3 and Channel 4. You've got a reset button, you've got your ports for your cassette, you've got a serial port, and your two joystick ports. That's all basically identical to the Color Computer 2. So not a lot of differences in the physical arrangement or anything of the system. It's what's inside that counts, and in this particular machine, it packs quite a bit more of a punch than the Color Computer 2 or the 64K version. The last major difference in the physical construction of the Color Computer 3 versus the 2 and the 1 might be easily overlooked, the underside of the Color Computer 3. There is a special port for RGB output. This was the first color computer model that was actually designed to work with a real monitor, and specifically the CM8 monitor, which was an RGB monitor. We have one of those, and it used this special multi-pin connector to connect to the Color Computer 3. This gave you true RGB video out, and there have been converters made out there that can actually take this and go to other standards like VGA and so forth. That graphics capability added a lot to the system, as we're going to find out. Throughout the line of color computer products, Tandy had a number of different floppy disk drives available for the systems. This is the FD502, 
which would have been the last floppy drive that Tandy made for this line of products. This particular one actually came with our Color Computer 3. It came from the original set, and it does have its matching controller pack, which is a little bit smaller form factor than the ones from the earlier FT500 and FT501. I guess they were able to fit a little bit more components on the board and a smaller footprint, which is kind of nice. It has a different cable arrangement on it. It kind of has this bundled cable. It's not a true ribbon cable. It's just kind of combined into one plastic sheath there. This particular one actually has two floppy drives installed. Both of these drives do seem identical, whereas, you know, some of the variations over time may have made a slightly different version of the faceplate for one of the drives. It's a nice bulky unit. The back of it has a power switch and it's got a fuse holder so you could protect it. The cable goes into the back of the unit here, but it's not connectorized, so you would have to take the case apart if you wanted to take that cable off. Throughout the line of color computer products, there were a number of different peripherals available for input devices for the system. Now we've talked about in other videos, of course, the Tandy joystick, which was used for the color computer series as well as the actual Tandy 1000. These were the deluxe joysticks. Not too much new ground to cover there. What I wanted to talk about today were the other input devices that we haven't covered before. And that would include the Color Mouse, which came out for the Tandy line, probably around the Color Computer 2, I believe. I don't think they had that out for the 1. That's this device here. It's a very simple mouse device. It's got a single button, nice big red button here. And it's got a very beefy mouse ball in it. Has a lot of weight to it. Doesn't feel too bad moving it around. I'm not sure how well that's going to track, but uh, we're going to give it a try. They also came out with another mouse. It's called the Deluxe Color Mouse. This was essentially the same product, but it actually had two buttons on it that you could use for different purposes. Gave it the Deluxe name for sure. Then they had a, another device that was kind of really important for the mouse use from what I understand. And we're going to try this today. This is called the High Resolution Joystick Interface. Because these original computer mouse devices used the joystick port on the color computer, the resolution wasn't great. This device actually allows you to use a second port, the cassette port, as well as the joystick port, and there's some kind of component in the box that allows it to track with an analog value. And it gets very complicated. I'm not going to get into all of the details of how that worked, but I'm very curious to see what a difference this will make in using the mouse devices with the Tandy Color computer. We also have a couple of devices for direct graphics input. Now, at this time, there was a lot of different programs for drawing and painting, and that was kind of one of the up and coming things in home computers. Tandy was no exception. They got on the bandwidth early with the X-Pad, which is a graphics pad and it has a pen device that you can actually write with on the pad. I believe you're supposed to have a piece of paper or something there so you don't just scratch the surface, so I'm not just going to drag that across. You could use this, as I understand, with any number of graphics programs or really anything that could use the mouse or the joystick. This was a product that came out even for the Color Computer 1, so this is not specific to the Color Computer 3. About the time the Color Computer 2 came out is when Koala Technologies came out with the TRS-80 touchpad. This is a different kind of touch device. It's a smaller pad that you could use with a finger or a stylus. Koala made this for a number of different systems, the Apple II, the IBM, as far as I know. This was the Tandy version. So we're also gonna give this a shot today with our artist program. One of the most interesting things for me about the Color Computer 3 was the fact that it actually had a dedicated specific monitor that Tandy had made for it. The other computers in the series were simply designed to use a television in your home, but this one actually got its own monitor called the CM8 and this was an RGB monitor similar to the CM5 which we saw with the Tandy 1000. The major difference with this monitor of course is the actual connector itself. In other monitors they would have a standard DB9 or DB15 type connector. This one actually has a header type connector so it literally just goes to pins on the underside of the color computer chassis. It makes compatibility a problem and makes things a little challenging if you want to use a different RGB monitor but it's pretty clever for the time and gives you a lot more advanced graphics capability for this machine than you would have had with a standard television. Everything else about the CM8 is pretty standard. This is a clean example that we have here. This actually came with the Color Computer 3 that we obtained in the collection. And as far as I know, it is in good working order. So I'm anxious to see how this performs with the Color Computer 3. I'm about to turn on the Color Computer 3 for the first time. Now I have tested this actual machine before and found that it worked fine, but I was using it in the normal environment using a television set. This will be the first time that I'm actually using this with the CM8 monitor. I'm actually kind of looking forward to it because one of the things that I never was a huge fan on in the Color Computer was just how the display looked being through the RF modulator. There's a lot of graininess and kind of fuzziness to the picture and a lot of kind of those rolling lines that you would see and you could see some of that in our Tandy video on the TDP System 100. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how this is going to look on the CM8 monitor today. Oh wow, 
Wow, that is, that is a significant difference. The text is clean and clear. There's no lines at all. It's a perfect green box. This might be because of the floppy drive controller, but there's actually a hard disk basic referenced here as well from RGB computer systems. A lot of you out there are experts on the color computer line. Please leave a comment below if you know about this particular aspect of the operating system. I'm not familiar with that or how it would be used, but I'm curious to learn more for sure. So back when they were developing the color computer three, the team of developers that were working on it ended up with a free space or an area of blank space in the ROM. Instead of just leaving it blank or unallocated memory, they decided to have a little bit of fun with it. Now the management at Tandy was not super happy about this, but uh, it did make it into the production run and it's very accessible. It's one of the first Easter eggs I know of in, uh, in coding and early computers. And so we're gonna do that now. If you hit uh, Control and Alt and then hit the reset button on the Color Computer 3, you will see an interesting image these are the three developers that actually developed the Color Computer 3, and they put this nice uh, video image of themselves in the extra space in the ROM on the machine, which is uh, pretty cool, I have to say, and a very neat example of an early Easter egg. The Color Computer 3 had a lot more capability than its predecessors, including the Color Computer 2 and the Color Computer 1. One of the programs that came out for the Color Computer 3, specific to the system, was a program called Color Computer Artist. This was specifically for the Color Computer 3. Never worry that you can't draw a straight line again. That's definitely me. Color Computer Artist draws pictures and designs for your business or for pleasure. Simply select a shape, choose a color, change a shade, or alter a design with the click of a button on your drawing controller. You can add text and alter the size of your drawing too. This uses uh, something called OS9, which was the operating system that was developed mainly with the Color Computer 3 in mind, although it does run on the Color Computer 2, as I understand as well. In the capture coming off of the RF port and off the composite output, the background is actually white and not green. Not sure why that is. I assume it has to do with the video mode. But just so you know, I'm actually looking at a green screen while the screen that you're seeing in the shots is actually a white background, and that's the reason why. Now, looking at the manual for Color Computer Artist, it automatically becomes apparent that they were supporting a number of different systems and configurations by this point. So there's some different instructions if you happen to have the mouse with single button, the deluxe mouse with two buttons, if you were using a joystick that had one or two buttons, or if you're just using the keyboard control. And furthermore, if you're using a mouse, you could use the high resolution interface that we talked about earlier or not use it. Those also have settings in the system. So I have it set up right now to use the low resolution version. I'm not using that adapter and I am using the single button mouse. Now, when you start the program here, it looks like you're presented with a single crosshair which you can start drawing right off the bat. I can tell you that my first impression is that that high resolution interface is probably going to be necessary. The mouse movement certainly works but it is uh, not great. The tracking is a little bit jumpy. It just seems a little slow, if I'm honest, overall. But let's see what it's like to actually draw a line. So if I click, that makes a nice beep. And we've got a, we've got a line. See, so there's a little bit of bounce. You can actually see that crosshair moving back and forth, and I'm not moving the mouse at all. And if we go down from here, I didn't get it perfectly on that edge because of that bounce. Try it again from this point. Go ahead and finish the rectangle. It says that uh, if you're using a joystick, you can press the lower button to access the menu. You can press the F2 button to access the main menu using the keyboard mouse. So let's see if that works. Ah, okay. There's our menu. Looks like we've got a selection of foreground and background colors. That's pretty cool. The colors that are shown on the RGB monitor are actually different than what we're getting on the RF or composite output. What you're seeing in the video is a little bit different from what I'm seeing on screen. I've got the foreground selected as a bluish color, whereas on my monitor it's showing as pink, and the background color is actually black, which would match. You can also choose the difference in plain, transparent, bold. So here's where we can actually choose the different types of drawing we're doing. We've got the normal line type, we've got the freehand, polygon. Let's do the polygon and see what that looks like. This should make a continuous shape, so if I drag it here, and then it's just going to keep, keep adding to that line and that shape. Apparently you can change the color while you're still drawing it. That's pretty cool. Let's put some text on here. This looks pretty good so far. I'm really curious what this would do with the high resolution joystick interface because I think it will make the mouse a little bit easier to move around. Essentially you have a port to plug in your joystick or mouse device and then you've got two connectors on it. One of these is going to go into the existing joystick port and the other one goes into the cassette port. That's so it can get some kind of analog comparison voltage from what I've read and there's a special setting for this in Color Computer Artist. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in. Now moving around in general it does seem to track better. 
Um, let me see if what looking, putting some lines in. I'm going to do some similar lines as last time. Strange that it left that pixel at the beginning, but at least this way you can actually go to one spot and it's not bouncing around, which is a definite plus. Yeah, the fine detail is much better with this adapter on. It's still not perfect, but it is more usable. Let's see what the fill function looks like. Oh, okay. So you can do polygons and all that. Looks pretty good overall. And the mouse movement is better with the high resolution interface. So what I want to do now is see what it's like if we can control this with the actual touchpad. And I've connected this exactly where we had the mouse. So far it hasn't crashed anything, so that's good. Just trying this out on screen, it does work. You can move around on screen. It's, it's a little touchy, that's for sure. But I can draw with it if I use the buttons on the system and start the line and then bring it over. It's very jumpy. As you can see, I'm not even moving my finger and it's just kind of jumping around the screen. Now that could be just because of the age of this touchpad. It could be because I'm not using a stylus. Maybe I'm using a not enough pressure. Maybe I'm using too much. I'm not really sure, but it does work. It's just hard to get it into the right place. If we go into like freeform mode, so I should be able to click and just draw. You can just see that it's, it's just kind of all over the place. There's no real freeform movement with it. It is making some interesting art though. So give it that. Oh no, took away all my lines. Now it's drawing them again. <laughs> so there you have it. There's some abstract art from yours truly. Maybe the fact that it did not come with a stylus. Now I'm not sure if we were just missing it, but there was no stylus that came in the package. There was also no software prepackaged with this. So I assume that it was just designed to work with anything that could work with a mouse or with a joystick, which is what we're doing here. But it doesn't seem like it's the ideal scenario. I did do quite a bit of experimenting with the TRS-80 X-Pad with the Color Computer 3, and I did not have any success. I went ahead and typed the programs and the samples from the X-Pad manual in order to draw freeform. Nothing seemed to work. I'm not sure if the X-Pad may not be compatible with the Color Computer 3, or if we just happen to have an X-Pad that does not work, but we're gonna do some more research into that, and hopefully in a later video, we'll be able to successfully demonstrate the TRS-80 X-Pad. One that we haven't tested yet here on Vintage Geek, and I thought would be kind of fun to do so today is the Tandy speech and sound cartridge. So today I'd like to see if we can make this Color Computer 3 talk. And we've got this short program typed now. Let's see what happens if we run it. It should give us a prompt to type in a phrase and uh, then it'll allow us to actually make the system speak that phrase. How about I can talk? I can talk. Oh, you can talk. Very nice. How about uh, Vintage Geek? Vintage Geek. <laughs> Sound a little bit like Jeek, but uh, I'll, I'll accept it. How about this one? Please eat, like, and subscribe. Actually, it doesn't sound too bad for a, an early voice synthesizer. I could see where you could integrate this into some code for early programs and make it speak to you in certain parts of a, maybe a game or even some basic rudimentary features. I, I would assume this would be kind of fun. And that's about all the time we have for the Color Computer 3 today, but don't worry, in the future we'll be doing another video, I'm sure, on the Color Computer 3, as we haven't even really gotten into the advanced capabilities of the system for games and other pieces of software that I definitely want to try out. Hoping to find out more about the X-Pad and why it didn't work with the Color Computer 3 specifically, so we got a little bit more research to do on that. But in the meantime, I really appreciate you tuning in and checking out the videos. If you like what we're doing here at Vintage Geek, please like and subscribe. It's gonna help us a lot as we grow here at the Vintage Geek Museum. Appreciate your support very much. And if you'd like to support the channel by getting some cool merch, we also have a merch store where you can get all the details in the description. So definitely check that out. In the meantime, I'm Aaron, and this is Vintage Geek. Please eat, like, and subscribe. Buy our merchandise. Happy and be.